Well, hello, dear friends. Uh, listen, you can see I've got Mel back on board again. Mel, so good to have you. Great to be back, Jay. Mel has been away. He has, as we know, he has been on vacation, but he, Mel doesn't really go on vacation. Well, he does, but his mind never stops. His mind never stops. And one of the things that Mel and I have been working on uh, for years, well, really has been years because we started this way back before I even left England. Well, back in 2016, 2017, we were looking at confronting uh, we didn't call it the standard Islamic narrative. It was the traditions back then. Now we call it, really, I think you were the one that coined the word, didn't you? S-I-N. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think so. so you yeah. What Al Yasser Qadi said, the standard narrative, and just put Islam into there to make it standard Islamic narrative, because that's what you're referring yeah. to, and coined that phrase. And now it's become a <laughs> phrase used all over the world. S-I-N, yeah. standard Islamic yeah. narrative, over here in the 9th and 10th century. And we've been asking, uh, we've been asking this for years. I've been asking this for 26 years. Why are we trusting this standard Islamic narrative? Because everything it tells us about what's happening in the seventh century, we're finding to be fraudulent. So let's go back to this period. Let's go back and see what's happening. Now, what we're gonna to do today, however, is a little bit different. We're not going to the seventh century now. We're not going to the seventh century. We're gonna go start testing the standard Islamic narrative in its own time. We're gonna say, hold on a minute. The standard Islamic narrative has always started from the premise that since the seventh century, since the time of Muhammad, there were no images permitted at all. No Im images of the Prophet, that that was anathema. And even today, you will not find images today. Today, you won't find that is true. What Mel has gone and done, however, is to go back to that time period when the images first started to appear, the paintings. We're talking about, well, we're talking about just that. We're looking at pictures and paintings and wall murals that are on buildings and we're going to go he's going to go back and show you that this is another problem a whole nother problem using the evidence we've always asked you to use evidence and mel has done so to use evidence that's on the ground to see whether the standard islamic narrative gets even this right was muhammad ever portrayed was his face ever portrayed because the standard islamic narrative no never 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 no one could portray his face well let's see what mel has found Mel, over to you. Sure. I'm just going to share my PowerPoint. Okay, so the title today is of Images and Idols, a fresh exploration into the history of how images and statues were viewed uh, by Islam through the direct evidence of artifacts. And uh, this is going to be in two parts. I'm going to start with part one today. I'm going to be looking at what occurred inside the Caliph's palaces primarily. Uh, we'll also look at what the Hadiths said. Um, and in part two, we'll actually look at images of Muhammad down through the centuries, totally contradicting the standard Islamic narrative. So in part one, what is typically asserted? Well, the typical assertion is that there was a universal ban on making images of Muhammad from the seventh century onwards. This included making images of humans and animals for fear of leading to idolatry. Related to that was a ban on going to graves and making mausoleums, which might also lead to idolatry. So let's just take an example of, of how this is depicted in the mass media from CNN here. Nothing in the Quran, Islam's holy book, strictly bars portrayals of Muhammad, but the faith like the Hebrew Bible's Ten Commandments has long discouraged an, any graven images, scholars say, to avoid the temptation towards idol worship. But is that actually true? In some ways, early Muslims were reacting to Christianity, which they believed had been led astray by, convinced, by conceiving of Christ, not as a man, but as a God. Now, if we look at that quotation here in the red box, the prophet himself was aware that if people saw his face portrayed by people, they would soon start worshipping him. Akbar Ahmed, who chairs the Islamic Studies Department at American University, told CNN. So he himself spoke against such images, saying, I'm just a man. So this is really the, the standard Islamic narrative being accepted hook, line and sinker. So image was, images were forbidden. Muhammad said it. And, and from day one, this was what happened. OK. In Sunni mosques, the largest branch of the faith, there are no human Im images of any kind. This is, again, what we're, we're told. And if we look down below, depictions of the prophet's teachings were sometimes used to bridge gaps in illiteracy. So this here, 
is a kind of a contradiction there of it. Um, so there's a kind of acknowledgement that maybe sometimes they allowed images in order to teach the illiterate about such things. But having said that, it says, even historical renditions of Muhammad by Muslim artists were careful not to paint the prophet in too much detail. But again, is this true? Well, make up your own mind here. I consider this to be quite a detailed painting on Muhammad, down to the, the finest details, and even the blushing of his cheeks and so on. What do you think, Jay, on that so far? Yeah, I mean, in fact, he is the best that's depicted there. He's even better than the angel, and he's certainly better than those two characters there in the center. So I would suggest that much was put and was focused on his face, his beard, even his mustache, his hands, uh, everything about him is very clear. And of course, we're looking yeah. at a, a scratched and worn painting. When it first came out, it would have been much more pristine. It would have been much more yeah. colorful and the cheeks would have been much more rosy. Yeah. And if you look at the year, this is 1320 AD. So the 14th century. So this is way back um, at a time when surely it should have been well established that no images are allowed. And yet here you have an image of Muhammad and it seemed to have gone unopposed by the Muslims of the time. Now, if we look at this uh, quotation here, um, Sheikh Ibrahim Magra, an imam in Leicester, says, Islam in general specifically forbids the usage of imagery. And when it comes to depicting the messenger Muhammad, peace be, be, be upon him, that prohibition becomes even more relevant. We are not allowed to depict him in any shape, any way or form. Clearly, he must be unaware of that image that we've just shown you. And then we have Nasima Begum, who says views didn't change, but yet it was nine centuries before images were covered up, i.e. destroyed. Um, uh, the, the central quote there, I would, uh, she's from the Muslim Council of Great Britain. She says the general view about depicting the prophet hasn't changed over time. However, contra contradicting herself, she says, it is believed that he should not be depicted whatsoever. In the 12th and 13th centuries, there may well have been books producing images of the prophet. However, the very fact that images of his face were covered up in the 16th century or so does show that Muslims were not happy about the depictions and therefore resulted in a veil being used to cover the face. She seems to have a double standard here in terms of when it's an, an expression of Muslim sentiments. So doesn't the fact that there were books that depict Muhammad show that some Muslims were happy about that back then, just as some Muslims were later not happy? So she have, wants it she wants it one way, but not the other way. Let me ask a question here, um, Mel. Is this not more an example of an evolving theology? So at the very beginning, there was no difficulty with this, just like we have seen with reference after reference after reference of the of the Quran being not preserved, that changes and omissions and deletions were quite normal, spoken about by Al-Buhari and, and Tirmidhi and many others. Sahih Muslim says about the fact that parts of it were lost. And yet today, you won't find any of that, that, that there has been an increasing strict adherence to nothing has changed, nothing has been moved. In the same token, are we not seeing this year? By the 12th and 13th century, they were quite happy with showing images. By the 16th century, it suddenly got shut down. And this may be a later theology. Absolutely. it's You can see when, when we look at what was considered acceptable in the Caliph's palaces back um, in the 8th century, it's clear that there was a very different attitude to images, whether it be paintings, statues, you name it. Um, and we can see over time a gradual evolution. And even up to recent times, there's two traditions at the end. You know, there's a tradition that has pretty much the same for the past 12, 1300 years, which was pretty much comfortable with images being used. And then there's a, a fork in the road, which we'll see later in the 1500s, when suddenly images start getting veiled. But it's not even a full getting rid of images. Images are still accepted, um, but just veiling of, of Muhammad's face. But actually, if you compare that with the Hadiths, which I'll show you in a second, you'll see the Hadiths actually have a much stricter 
prohibition on images. So they haven't ever properly implemented these hadiths, which kind of suggests that either there's been 1400 years of really bad Muslims or the hadiths maybe are a later fabrication and they don't actually reflect the evolution that has happened over time. That's my uh, view on it. So part two then is were pictures of Muhammad specifically banned in the hadiths? Notice of the emphasis on Muhammad himself. Were they specifically banning his image? Now I've taken this from uh, answeringislam.org, which has a very good um, article on this. And I just draw your attention to, well, actually I'll probably read the opening paragraph just to give you a sense of it. It says numerous passages in the Quran prohibit idolatry and worshiping statues or pictures, but there is not even a single verse in the Quran that explicitly or implicitly says not to have any pictures of Muhammad. This bears repeating. There is not a single verse in the Quran that prohibits making or having pictures of Muhammad or people or animals or trees. In fact, there are some verses in the Quran which mention images in a positive context, and which therefore presuppose that some statues or images were approved by God. And this is amazing when you think about it, that the Hadiths that we'll see in a moment are overruling the Quran on certain uh, images. However, the vast majority of Muslims are Sunni Muslims who regard six authorized collections of Hadiths as the highest written authority in Islam after the Quran. The Hadiths are records often very detailed of what Muhammad taught and did. We give multiple quotations to show that these teachings are not confined to just one writer or collector, but are spread throughout the different Hadith collections. Where multiple trustworthy Hadiths agree, Sunni Muslims will take this as binding. In other words, people today are kicked out of Islam or even killed based on the Hadiths. Now, here's the, here's the, the real point here. Pictures of Muhammad are not exactly forbidden in the Hadiths either. The Hadiths do not single out Muhammad's picture. Rather, in the Hadiths, we find the prohibition of all pictures of people or animals, which would include pictures from a camera. And I don't know about you, Jay, but I've yet to see a, a, a Dawa um, activist refusing to go on camera or, or to have their picture taken. Any when thoughts on that so far? When you say, which would include pictures on the camera, you're, that's your aside. That's not in the Hadith. There were no cameras back that early. Yes, yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's the, the, uh, the website's uh, opinion on the Hadith. So this is not from the Hadith itself. This no. is the 21st century opinion. Because yeah. if that yeah. were so, then if that were in the Hadith itself, then that you could pretty well date the <laughs> to the time the cameras existed. But getting yeah, back no. to this, yeah, I, and I, that is a double standard. Now, you know, uh, obviously, to be fair, what the comeback is that nobody, when they put their, when they allow themselves to be filmed, are saying that that is to be worshipped, and I think that's oh. where it comes down to. But images on a building, images on or a statue, can easily be worshipped, and that was where the concern was. We had this discussion earlier, uh, Mel, in another program where you and I talked about the images that were on Abdul Malik's coins. His images were there in 693, and then in 696, he took his images off. All images were taken off. And from 696, no coins anywhere have images, no Muslim coins have images anymore of, uh, of anybody, okay, including Abdul Malik himself. And we thought that that was where the prohibition, that's what we had thought earlier. But you're yeah. going to know that this actually is much, much later, because the, yeah. the standard Islamic narrative would come after 696. They don't even begin to appear until 833 and 870. So we're talking about 9th century for the standard Islamic narrative. You're going to say that it may be even much later that this prohibition came in. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah and you know, even from caliph to caliph, there's different opinions on things. And uh, just because one caliph decides to remove images from coins doesn't mean that that became the norm or that it was even practiced within um, the palaces and so on. And as you, as I'll show you, the caliphs were still very happy with having images. And we're going to see that they're, they're happy with images, both in the late you made era, but well into the Abbasid era as well. So, you know, uh, those coins don't fully tell a, a picture of their attitudes towards images at that stage. Now, the Hadiths say 
all paintings of pictures was banned from Muhammad's own time. For example, Sahih Muslim says, Ibn Umar reported Allah's messenger uh, having said, those who paint pictures would be punished on the day of resurrection. Another one, uh, let me just, uh, if we go to the second last one, no picture of people or animals according to Bukhari um, is allowed. And the conclusion, uh, you can all read this all yourself, Conclusion, it is clear that the Hadiths prohibit pictures of animals or people, especially in homes. There is no focus on pictures of Muhammad per se. All pictures of people and animals are forbidden. It is completely general prohibition. Now, the, so the, the two points to draw from this, first of all, it's not def- confined to Muhammad. It's all animals, people, and it's especially forbidden in homes. And this is going to be interesting because let's have a look at what happened inside the caliph's homes. Did they practice what was supposedly preached. So, according to the Hadiths, this picture from the 13th century ought to have been banned. Uh, This is just one of many pictures that you can find all through Islamic history. So let's move on to part three now. Early artifacts tell a completely different story to that of the Hadiths. When we look at early artifacts, it seems like the Hadiths were written during a much later era. The artifacts tell one story, while the Hadiths tell a completely different story. And we're going to look at evidence from the Umayyad and Abbasid periods. periods. While it is unknown for sure if humans or animals were depicted in art inside mosques, in principle, the caliphs took a very relaxed view in their own palaces and they set the agenda. So if the caliphs were telling people not to have images and they were having images in their own homes, that to me seems like a bit of a contradiction. What, what are your thoughts on that, Jay? Well, obviously, there's one standard for you and one standard for me. And the standard for me, as being the leader, I can have all kinds of images. That shows that the aristocracy were living by a different set of rules, which is not surprising, I guess. Uh, that is quite normal. It even happens in almost every religion with almost every people. But it shows the hypocrisy of the, the standard itself. Yeah. I would I would go further. I, I would say that it's not just um, and, and, you know, this is the excuse is often given by uh, Muslims is that, oh, these were degenerate uh, caliphs. And the reason why this was going on is because they weren't particularly good Muslims. But these palaces were open to visitors and, you know, cross section of the community were visiting these uh, palaces and no one complained. There was no uproar about this. Um, or at least it doesn't seem to be, um, and these images were left in place for centuries and centuries. Nothing seemed to be challenged. Um, and so that doesn't make a lot of sense to me unless it was the norm across society. Um, now, the, the, one of the experts in all of this is Dr. Beatrice Liel, um, and she has written an article, Paintings in the Early Islamic World. She says... One of the widespread myths about Islamic art is that images of living creatures are banned. It is true that the Quran forbids the worship of idols. An idol was usually understood in antiquity and the Middle Ages in Europe and the Middle East to mean a painting or statue. For that reason, images of people and animals were almost never depicted in mosques. However, in other settings, there were plenty of images of all kinds. In fact, more figural painting in the Levant has survived from the early Islamic period roughly the 7th to the ninth centuries than from the centuries immediately before Islam. That is quite interesting. Um, the other thing to, to bear in mind is, okay, so there, you could say, well, they didn't allow them in mosques, but they, they allowed them in other locations. But people still prayed in their homes. You know, many Muslims, I'm sure, today pray in their homes. So how, how does it make sense to have images in your home where you're praying if, if the issue is that there's a danger of adultery? Surely you would have to ban them in your homes as well. Any thoughts on that, Jay? The comeback to that is it, uh, your home is, a different, is not known as a place for worship, whereas mosques are uniquely created for worship, created for prayer. And so that's why it would be stand to reason. And I can understand the logic in that. It would stand to reason that mosques have to have 
uh, have to prohibit any images. So, because if you're praying, you could pray to that image. Whereas the home is not really a place that you would think of worship. It is only a place that you do the five prayers when you're in your own private home. And I would suggest that most Muslims would say there's a prayer room. Most homes have a prayer room like they do on university campuses. And those prayer rooms and the university campus prayer rooms are almost, they almost take the function of a mosque. You won't find any images on any, in any of those locations. Yeah, and that's and that's a fair comeback. But one of the one of the contradictions in all of this is the fact that not only were homes decorated with images, but Qurans were illustrated, and even sirahs were also illustrated, and collections of hadiths were also illustrated with images of people and animals. And uh, so that is a major contradiction. And surely, if um, if it's forbidden to depict animals and people in a place of worship, surely holy books would also fall under that. I, I would suggest that um, there's something not quite right in the standard Islamic narrative on, on all of this. Could I come back on those two as well? Go back to yeah, that? Yeah. I would suggest that what you're looking at here and what you're seeing is nothing more than copying of what Christians were doing. Christians, if you look at, if you go to the British Library, the Ridback Gallery, you will see there are many Bibles with beautiful illustrations all the way through them in this same time period. And as they, you have the interaction being created within Christians and Muslims, the Muslims are just copying what we did. They're doing what we do. And they would make a distinction because as we do, we don't sit there and have a problem with images in our Bible. No one suggests that because those images are there that they will be worshipped rather than Jesus himself. They would probably come back and say, that's the same thing. When you read a text, you're not worshipping the text itself. You're not putting it up there. Now, some people will say, well, why are they putting it on a stand? Is that not worship? Muslims, I've always, whenever I ask that, they've always come back to no, there's no worship intended. It's more out of respect that they put it on a stand. And when you put images, uh, they would probably come back and say, if you put images, it's more to help the reader to focus on who is it that this is about. It's referring to this man, Muhammad, or it's referring to this man, uh, whoever the, whatever the prophet is that that particular verse is where that yeah. is depicting. We do the same thing. The other thing they would say is that a, a Quran is not to be worshipped. It's nothing more than a place, a, a book to be memorized. The worship takes place when you do your prayers, like I said earlier. And where yeah. you do your prayers, you don't have images for that very reason. Yeah. And that's absolutely perfectly fine. And that's a standard that I, I would be very comfortable with, that distinction. But here's the, the, the kicker is that the Hadiths don't make that distinction. The Hadiths are very clear. It doesn't allow any exceptions. It basically says all paintings of animals and humans. And that's the bit that is often overlooked. And uh, I would suggest that because that is so, well, extreme, I suppose would be one way of putting it, but it's so at odds with the history. To me, it suggests that this couldn't have been from an earlier time, these Hadiths, because surely um, there'd be some acknowledgement of that in the actual artifacts and the fact that there's such a, a prevalence of these images when really there should be an absence I think you're what you're making. I mean, Mel, what you're making right there, I think, is an enormous point, because what you're saying is that this is a, a, a problem that's certainly because the images were there. And I imagine probably because they were there in the Quran, because they were there in people's homes, people started going to them and actually praying towards them. And this was seen and observed, and therefore they had to do something about it. So by by putting these restrictions in also uh, suggests that this is a much later problem, much like the Shiite going, the Shiite, remember the Shiites have always, even up today, they go to tombs of many of their holy men, and they actually pray at the tomb and pray towards the men, which is a clear observance, uh, uh, is anathema, that's heretical right there. Could, if, could that not suggest, therefore, what you're, and this is the thesis you're getting at, that this is a later theology that was then introduced into the Hadith to eradicate this very problem, which suggests that this is, a, you can almost probably date when the Hadith were written. And uh, yeah. the Hadith do not reflect a 7th or 8th or 9th century, not even a 9th century environment, because you're seeing images everywhere all over the 9th century. And much later, you showed one from 13th, uh, 15th yeah. and later, and you're going to be showing more there later than that. So this may be a 15th and a 16th century problem, which yeah. is probably where I would suggest many of the Hadiths were written. Yeah, and the thing is, 
the you know the complaints about them praying at these these tombs how old are these tombs many of these tombs are a thousand years old so for a thousand years they have all these tombs that people over that that length of time were happy to go and visit and pray at um that contradicts the idea that the, the there were these hadiths prohibiting it and these tombs remember are in the heart of islam in places like medina and uh, this is something i'll be looking at at a later stage but it's uh, it is quite um a contradiction of this standard islamic narrative let me go come back to our powerpoint so um another thing is yet yeah, even today we can see the following but this is no innovation so this is actually a children's quran an illustrated quran and inside it you know they, they have from what i could tell they seem to have avoided depicting people but the principle is broken in that there are animals there and if 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 the hadiths are to be followed there really shouldn't be but you know we can see that there there is a tradition that goes back where images were accepted uh down through the centuries um let's and, and that, go, go from there that, go back to that picture i think maybe the reason why they are having a problem depicting adam and eve is they would be naked and so they could put them into the <laughs> uh because Ex- of their- exactly yeah I remember when I was a little boy, I couldn't believe some of the things we had in Sunday school with Adam and Eve. They're both <laughs> naked. And I said, wow, this is the first time <laughs> pornography yeah. at such a young age for such young eyes. But in this case, yeah. it is it is a contradiction. You're showing animals are also prohibited because you can you can also bow down to animals as much as you can to people. So that would be a contradiction right there. You're right. Yeah, I, it, it seems like there's there's two traditions uh, one an earlier one where they were comfortable with images and then there's a later tradition and they haven't fully resolved this contradiction and uh, and they particularly object to the west um you know drawing attention to this i think particularly you know the the ferrari about mocking images of muhammad you know over the past few years i think it's partially because the there is an internal conflict about this this question it's never been fully resolved really um, so if we look at, um, say, the 7th to the 9th century, artwork in that early period tended to make everyone look Roman and Greek. Why is that? Um, it was greatly influenced by classical Roman and Greek styles, especially Byzantine iconography. The origin of Byzantine iconography is Greek by heritage and dates back to the 3rd century and earlier. Um, and... The Hagia Theodora school teaches the ancient and most original Byzantine icon- iconography techniques of the Cretan, Macedonian, etc. historical regions of Greece. And essentially because this um, art form was developed in Greece, typically in if, if you, an artist copies the conventions of this, everyone is depicted like a Greek, you know. Now, you can imagine this is a, a popular uh, form of painting pe- people in, in the 7th and 8th century and, and continued on. You can imagine how um, if you wanted to depict um, Muhammad or other people at a later period that you wouldn't want to be choosing this because no one would want to have Muhammad depicted like a Greek person. They, you know, anything but that. And there's also an issue of they don't really want to be seen as imitating the Byzantines, at least not in the, at a later time when they want to establish their own independence. So, you know, that's quite, that's quite telling. In later periods, a non-Byzantine, specifically Far Eastern style was chosen. And as a result, everyone is depicted as Asian. And that's kind of quite interesting, including Muhammad. So as we'll see later um, in part two, it's it's very hard to find an image of Muhammad that doesn't look Asian. And I think it's because they, you know, these Arabs who were familiar with the, the Silk Road would have been familiar with this art form. And rather than choosing a Byzantine art form, they decided to go for this one. May, and may this thing there. Yeah. Could this also show that the further you are from the center of Islam, the further you are into the diaspora, the less that this was a problem. And of course, the Asians would be as far away as you can get from the centers of Islam. So there they didn't have a difficulty with this. Whereas in the Arab world, this was a very much of a difficulty. That's why you don't see Asian art that far uh, towards what we now know today as, as the Middle East. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Now, so let's look at some artifacts. So uh, the Kaiser Amra in Jordan is from the 730s. It's the best preserved early Islamic, uh, sorry, the best preserved early Islamic paintings are from the palaces of the Umayyad Caliphs and Princes. These mostly date to the first half of the 8th century, starting with the most impressive, the bathhouse of Kaiser Amra in Jordan. It was built for the Prince Al-Walid ibn Yazid. It has an audience hall and a suite of three bathrooms, and the walls of every room are painted with an amazing assortment of scenes. Now, try and bear this in mind. According to the standard Islamic narrative, all images were banned of animals or people. Okay, so just try and... Try and reconcile that with a period in which caliphs were spreading Islam around the Middle East, if you can. So here's the palace from the outside. Lovely building. And here's it. Here's one of the paintings. This is um, I originally when I first saw this, I, I assumed it was a man. But actually, I was corrected later. I said, no, this is a naked woman, practically uh, in a in a pool uh, with various onlookers staring at her and so on. And uh, this is a complete contradiction. This is, um, as you can see, a bathing scene on the west wall of the west aisle of the audience hall of the caliph of that time. Imagine that. So this is a place where the, the, the caliph was happy to, to bring in visitors from around the area and uh, have all of these images on the wall. And uh, the description of it here is in the middle of one wall of the audience hall, a semi-naked woman stands at the edge of a bath. She is watched by a group of men on a balcony, some of whom point at her and one dressed in a bright blue robe on the far left leans forward over the railings to get a better view. A figure stands behind the bather, also gesturing at her and another woman's head can just be seen above peering down from a little window. No one is sure what the scene means, but it is full of drama. Perhaps some of the figures were portraits of real people. Maybe the man in blue is Al-Walid himself, the caliph. Or perhaps they are represented, they represented more abstract concepts or qualities. But in any case, you can see clearly they're very comfortable with not only the, the images of people on the walls, but actually of naked people on their walls. And here is an image of Al-Walid ibn Yazid on the south wall, and he's depicted sort of giant size, surrounded by people. Um, this doesn't seem to be um, a contradiction of any hadiths that are in existence. If these hadiths banning all paintings of people really existed, why is Al-Walid having himself painted on the wall of his audience hall? Uh, feel free to jump in, Jay, if you if you want to make any comments on those. Uh, and I would suggest that almost all of these, again, is copying what the Christians were doing. These are quite symptomatic of what was quite normal. And if you are you're 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 competing with the Byzantines, they're your biggest they're they're the biggest competition up in the north. You want what they have, or you're copying what they have copied. Much of Islam is nothing more than copying, anyways. And that's why I'm not surprised that you see this. But this contradicts everything we know about the, what the Hadith are saying. So Absolutely. whether they are copying or whether they are doing, now you might say, well, maybe the, the caliphs stand apart because of their aristocratic uh, stance. They can do things which others cannot do. That's true, and that's found in every culture and every with every religion. There has been that problem. But what is fascinating is that this doesn't seem to be a problem at that time in the no. 730s. No, it, it's, uh, it gets even more... Um, you know, it gets more interest. There'll be some paintings that I think some of you may be shocked with what, what they have in, in terms of their, their sculptures and paintings that they have in, in these buildings. But uh, Dr. Beatrice Leal says, on other walls at Kaiser Amra are portraits of the patron and images of kings, wrestlers, hunters, fishermen, dancers, musicians, and mythological characters. There's also a, a painted star chart in the dome of the sauna with the symbols for the Greco-Roman constellations. Here is an obviously topless woman, uh, proudly on display in the Caliph's palace. I'm sure there's teaching in Islam about modesty and, and uh, covering up and so on, but um, the Caliph doesn't seem to have got that memo, it would seem. Well, if you look uh, at the Quran, there's no, <laughs> there's no uh, prohibition about 
nudity. In fact, if you look at chapter 55 and 56 of the Quran, it's very vivid as to who are these hoodies that are going to be in heaven. And they are women with, you know, women with breasts, obviously. But it's good, it, it's good to see that this was not a problem at the very beginning. This became much more of a problem as we see in the Hadith. Again, suggesting the Hadith were written at a much later date. Absolutely. Now here's another example there. Um, the artwork isn't particularly good. <laughs> I, I, I thought when I first saw this, I think the Caliph, if he paid for the artist, um, he should have got his money back. But none the, like nonetheless... Like the beginning of a Picasso. Maybe Picasso got his ideas from yeah. his piece. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, here's another. Um, so you have uh, two bathers, you know, with um, bath towels around them. It's, uh, I'm sure there's prohib prohibitions on... Uh, people kind of um, getting together like this in the kind of a lurid situation. Um, again, it seems to contradict so much of what is in the standard Islamic narrative. And um, this, was not an this was not isolated to one place. There were probably equally varied wall paintings at the Palestinian palace and bathhouse of Kurbat al-Mafjar, based on the fragments remaining, which show pieces of people, animals, and buildings. And this one is quite interesting as well. There's a, a statue or figurine, uh, which surely should have been a shirk. The figure was found within the Umayyad palace of al Mushata. As you can see, it's the lower part of a semi naked female figure. Uh, it's carved out of limestone. The figure has a drape over her thighs, the edge of which she holds with her left hand along with a basket or bag. And as you can see, the portions. The proportions of this female figure are curvaceous and voluptuous. And, uh, you know, that's quite a contradiction, having a statue. Um, there is a danger of having a statue of a human figure that it, you might be tempted to make that into an idol, even if it's not in a mosque. And um, Kaiser al Hair al-Garbi um, was built for the Caliph Hisham, and among its decorations were two Huge frescoes on floors. One of the panels shows vine scrolls, centaurs, and a woman carrying fruits in a cloth. She is probably the classical figure, uh, Gay or Gaia, personification of the earth. There it is there. So, so, so it's actually, it looks very Greek in style. And uh, as I say, that's in Syria. And here's another interesting detail in this one. We can see uh, just in, in, in terms of the red box there, the horseman has got um, uh, uh, what you call a, a, a flowing scarf headra uh, headdress, which was adopted from elite Sasanian fashion, suggesting uh, Persian influence there. And as you can see, there's no prohibition of music or anything like that as, as we see in later traditions. What's, uh, what's the uh, dates on these? This is the early 8th century. So we're talking about the 730s, 740s. So these are all about the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, there was, uh, if there were a universal prohibition against images of people, how would this impress devout visitors? Palaces like these were usually outside cities, but they were often near main roads and so were relatively easy for their patrons to visit. They would have been used as temporary retreats, holiday homes, and probably also as sites of display, places for the Umayyad aristocrats to entertain and impress visitors. Grand paintings would have helped to create the desired atmosphere of luxury and sophistication. And nope, it didn't end with the Abbasids either. Can I just say but something I, here? Can I yeah. just say something? You're looking at palaces and you're assuming, therefore, and we may, I made this assumption a little early, and I need to correct myself. I'm assuming that this only happened in palaces. The only, no, it could probably, if it happened in palaces, it probably happened amongst the people as well. And this was probably, if you were to go to many of the, uh, if you go to the marketplaces of those same places, you would find probably find similar images. The only reason that we have palaces to look at is because this is the only thing that's been retained. It's the only thing that would have lasted, in this case, for hundreds of years. The stuff that's on the ground, the stuff that's in the marketplace would not have lasted. Therefore, we don't have examples of it. But the palaces, yes. we do. So we have to be careful that we don't assume that there was one 
law for the, like I was do, doing earlier for the aristocracy and one law for the others. I would suggest that if it's the, if they, if this is in the palaces, then the people that were also under their jurisdiction were also following suit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you have the, the top dog, if I may if we use that term, the caliph. Okay, he's surrounded by aristocrats and the aristocrats are copying his lead. And then there are people underneath the aristocrats who are following the aristocrats lead because everyone wants to follow the fashions of the people at the top. Um, so it, it, I would suggest also it just reflects the culture of the time. It was late antique, uh, the late antique. Um, and this is following straight from all the traditions from the Romans and Greeks. Nothing had changed. It's, it's, it's the same as it had been for centuries. At another, you may cite Caesar al Halabat in Jordan. The wall paintings include plant scrolls framing mythical submerges, if I'm pronouncing it correct, beasts with lion's paws and peacock's wings. Medallions inhabited by little animals and people were also found at the ninth century Abbasid palatial complex of Samara. So again, we're seeing evidence even in Abbasid era of animals and people being depicted on, you know, medallions here in that case. And I think this is one example of it from the Kaiser al Halabat, even though it's not very clear. It's uh, depicting a kind of a, uh, a mythical animal there. Now, if you look at the Kurbat al uh, Mafjar, which is three miles north of Jericho. Um, it's, uh, this is a quote that, from that essay that I mentioned earlier. In secular Islamic buildings, figural imagery was no problem, probably because idol worship was not seen as a risk outside of religious settings. So there you have in this image um, a line there on the right inside the red box. The line probably stands for the caliph and patron of the building, since lines were symbols of power. So again, doesn't seem to be any problem with depicting animals or people. And here in the same palace, you can see there's clearly statues in the palace, statues of people, statues of animals. Again, no problem apparently with, with any of this. No, obviously it's not in a mosque, um, but it's interesting this, this is in a compound in which a mosque also exists. And here is a statue. It could be the caliph. We, we assume it's the caliph, or perhaps it's meant to be Muhammad. Who knows? But again, there appears to be no prohibition against it yet. Um, it's uh, quite oh, remarkable. Before. This one you have shown before. This is the one uh, that with, with the man with the sword that's very similar to the coin of of Abdel Malik, who has the yes, same yeah. staff, the same sword going the same direction, proving yeah. that this is a copy of that which came earlier. That would have been 692. This would be 730s. Absolutely. And this kind of confirms that there's still no problem with images. You know, um, it could be that the images were removed from the coins simply because there wasn't enough space to put the propaganda on the coins. And that it was just a question of, we can't fit in the, the messages we want to have on the coins. So the simple solution is just to remove the images. It do, uh, the, the evidence on the ground in the palaces is that there doesn't seem to be any cultural shift away from images. They're still happy with images on the walls, on the floors, statues, medallions, you name it. All of the evidence that you would you would have for a people who are still culturally comfortable with having images of animals and people and so on. And there's, as you can see, standing on, uh, on a, on a plinth, I suppose you call it, uh, which um, uh, animals of some kind, I, I don't know if they're meant to be lions or something like that. They look like lions to me. Yeah. And again, just remember Sheikh Ibrahim Ibra Magra's statement. He says, Islam, in general, specifically forbids the usage of imagery. How, how, I wonder how true is that? Um, and then one other area of interest would be the mosaics in early Islamic world, again from Dr. Beatrice Leal. Uh, she says that the majority of early Islamic mosaics, however, do not have devotional subject matter. That in itself is interesting. Um, here is an, ex uh, an exception to that. Um, and you can see that this, uh, let me see, where is this? Uh, this one, 
It's decorated with an image of a mihrab and a quote from the Quran. So this is the early 8th century. Um, so there's a beginning um, devotion towards Islam in evidence, but not much. And this is consistent with other things we've seen in terms of rock inscriptions. It seems like the 730s and 740s is when it, Islam started to really kind of emerge out of nothing. Um, and uh, it, But it took a, a, quite a while for a consistent um, evidence of devotion to Islam started to appear. But it's, it's not a lot at that time. Now, this one you might assume is a, a, an image from a mosque, but this is actually from a church. In the mid-700s, over a century after the Islamic conquest, the congregation of St. Stephen's Church at Umm al rasas in Jordan commissioned a new floor for their sanctuary. If you compare this to the picture from the hall at Kirbat al mafjar you can see similar patterns. Now, this is actually in support of what you said earlier about the fact that they're imitating the Byzantines. Well, you have a clear example of this. The... Um, the uh, what you call the Caliph's Palace is copying mosaics from the, the Byzantine floors. Um, and uh, you can see that they've also copied the idea of using geometrical shapes in mosaics and so on. Fascinating because these are much, much better done than the mosaics of the, the if, if they were Muslims or the pre, uh, proto-Islam proving and suggesting to me that this was not a problem in Christianity. We were way ahead of them. And that has been the case right down through the centuries. The Muslims have never really kept up with the beautiful artistry that we have in our, not only on our churches, but also in our books and also on our walls. And Islam has moved the other direction since that period, mainly because they just didn't have the same concepts. Or in this case, they there was really the, the beginning of this anti-iconography, the, the depiction, uh, because in this case, it became a theological problem. Yeah. And actually, uh, in terms of getting artisans that were able to do this, most of them, if not all of them, were Christians. So it would have been a real struggle in the early days to actually get Christians particularly willing to, to um, decorate mosques in this way. Um, so they did what they could. And in fairness, you know, some of the, of the, uh, the work was, you know, pretty good, but it was an imitation, though, of the earlier Byzantine work. Now, um, something doesn't quite add up. Why were there images of people and animals in the palaces of caliphs from the early centuries of Islam if this teaching existed at that time, promoted by those very same caliphs? Do we know for sure when specific hadiths were written? Why don't we see the prohibitions being implemented in practice until quite late into the Islamic period, example, during Ottoman times and the beginnings of Wahhabism. Popular devotion was against these prohibitions, and one proponent of these prohibitions, Ibn Taymiyyah, or Taymiyyah, was jailed. Such was the opposition to panning images. You know, so it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. And it's interesting, you mentioned about the um, Al-Bukhari earlier, about uh, the earliest volume. Uh, could you just remind me when that was from? We have only, the only reference we have for a volume, remember there are nine volumes in Al-Buhari, the earliest is from the 11th century. The other eight volumes of the nine volumes don't really appear to the 15th and 16th century. So you're talking about five, 800 years after Muhammad. So suggesting, wow. and you could really say that maybe this suggests that all of these hadiths that do have a prohibition against iconography, against any images, were probably introduced that late. We can't say that yet. We can't say that yet. But sir, yeah. you've shown that and you've proved it, that all the earliest images in the 8th century, these are almost all 8th century, 730s and whatnot, they, have, they were quite easy. Uh, they were allowed images. Maybe that's because the hadith were written much, much, much later. So um, now I should say before I get into the conclusion is that I, in part two, um, for those who are watching, if you if you uh, uh, wait until part two, I'm going to go through the the images right through the centuries from the earliest images right up to up to literally only a few years ago, and um, I think 
the evidence is very much on the side of the idea that the Hadiths were actually a later invention because the artifacts, the paintings themselves, don't fit with uh, the idea that's depicted in the Hadiths themselves. So my conclusion is that this is a snapshot of life in the early 8th century when Islam was beginning to emerge. A lot of potential evidence has been lost over the centuries for various reasons, for example, intentional destruction. But enough has survived to give us an accurate depiction of the views held by the elite at that time, the same people who were promoting Islam among the masses. It doesn't appear likely that there was a universal prohibition on the making of pictures of people or animals as asserted by the Hadiths. Indeed, the use of merely geometric patterns in early mosques might simply be in imitation of Byzantine fashions and prohibitions on certain images was confined just to mosques, but not to other places like palaces and perhaps to mausoleums and tombs. The latter places often castigated by Hadiths as places of idolatry. Were these a grey area in the rules? So um, please watch the next episode to see how images of Muhammad evolved over time. And before I finish, um, I, I was asked by Murad to announce that he's begun his new YouTube channel called Saint Murad and will begin making videos soon. So I'll stop it there. Saint Murad? <laughs> Is he not putting himself up not to be worshipped? <laughs> yeah, he's promoting himself. <laughs> promoting himself as a saint? <laughs> a saint, yeah. He still has to... <laughs> That's tongue-in-cheek. He's doing that. Yeah, as... absolutely tongue-in-cheek, yes. That's fun. Good old guy. Yeah. I mean, that's great. But we're going to have to keep pushing. Saint Murad, our saint. We yeah, yeah. have a saint on the team, uh, at least self-proclaimed in, that, in yeah. that context. And in some ways, it's it's symptomatic of what we're just talking about, isn't it? This That's the very thing uh, that Islam today has prohibited. Any notion that there could be anyone or anything, an animal or a human that is uh, alongside God, and that, that commits the unforgivable sin, shirk, uh, which uh, may, uh, is the Arabic name for just that. Someone who is that is a mushrik. People like us uh, who are, who they, Muslims believe have elevated Jesus to the standard of God are mushrikun. So here we have, I mean, you've, you've got, and you've, you're really shutting down this narration, this narration of the hadith. The hadith are very clear, and it's you're correct, uh, that there is to be no depiction of any human, of any animal, of anything that's living, because that would be uh, that would be in competition to God Himself. Only God is must be worshipped, and there is this fear that people by depicting will will worship the image rather than than the God Himself. So here is a. Here is a, a classic case where you have gone through and say, hold on a minute. If the standard Islamic narrative says that this began with the time of Muhammad himself, and this is what Muhammad prohibited, therefore, it, it's something that we should see depicted in the evidence on the ground. And we've always wanted to go to the evidence on the ground. Well, in your case, you're going to the evidence on the walls, which is on the ground, because those images that you showed, and you showed a lot of images, images of bathers, images of women, images of men, images of animals. Uh, and these images are very clear that this was quite normal, be it as it may, that they are on palaces of people. And you gave out quite a few names. You had the Qasr al Hayr al Garbi. You also had uh, Qasr al Halabat and Khirbat al Mafjad. These are all from Syria, Jordan, and Jericho. These are three places where depiction was quite normal. Could it be that maybe only in palaces this was allowed? We would suggest that no. If it's in the palaces, it was also on the in the marketplaces. We only see it in the palace because those are the only structures that have re been remained, have remained uh, throughout the centuries because they were built so large and so big and so well. Now, again, you just shut down this idea of prohibition against iconography, iconography, and why then Muslims have only moved to script. They only have. Pictures, I mean, almost all their, not pictures, they, almost all of their mosques and all of their books have beautiful calligraphy. In fact, they have competitions for calligraphy. That's all they have. That's all that they're permitted. Thank God we're allowed to use artistry. Thank God we're allowed to use music. Thank God we have the freedom to express our devotion and our admiration for God through picture, through paintings, through art forms such as music and also 
through the, the whole expression of singing to God as we do in our worship services. That is never really taken hold in Islam. And it's one of the tragedies for, I, I, I remember talking to so many of my uh, Afro-American when I did my survey on people who had left Christianity and become Muslims. One of the first things they, that they said that they missed the most was the music, uh, was just the expression of music and how the music in the churches in the Afro-Caribbean and Afro-American community has given us, well, that's how we have jazz today. Some of the, that's why we have soul today. All these expressions in music that have become popularized were we begun in the churches and were begun by Christians who are worshiping God. And in no way, th shape or form does the music take on any hope, any uh, devotion itself. You don't devote, you don't worship the music. Oh, now some people might say, I do worship the music, but they don't actually bow to the music as a divine uh, piece of, of uh, well, what is it? What, is, what would you call music? A piece of, what is music? Music is a sound, a divine sound. It is our expression and love and devotion completely lost on Islam, completely lost on Islam. And yet, yet at the very beginning, it wasn't lost. At the very beginning, they did have depiction. At the very beginning, as you're showing, Mel, there were beautiful pieces of artistry copied, yes, by, right from the Byzantines in the Greek and Roman style, as Islam only copies. It, it has a hard time inventing anything creative. It always just copies and borrows and pilfers and steals. And uh, we, we, we will know that. Uh, and as we're finding with the Quran, much of it has been copied, borrowed, pilfered, and stolen. Yet, where did this injunction happen? And you're bringing up a really interesting point, because you're suggesting that this may have happened much later, redacted back onto the time of Muhammad. We, and then given voice or given dates uh, from the ninth century, but you're suggesting maybe this may be from the 15th and 16th century where this prohibition finally was introduced as a theological concept in contradistinction to what was happening in Christianity and as a way of pulling back, as another way of saying, we are different than you. And this is one of the differences. We do not worship man. You worship man, a guy named Jesus. We love him and we see him as a problem. You worship him, but you have elevated him and committed shirk. We wear, refuse to do that. So therefore we eradicate anything that would even suggest that. Now that would be a theological concept that someone needs to run down. And that would be something that someone needs to do. When did that theology come into place? You have said, follow the pictures. Like we've said earlier, follow the coins or follow the rock inscriptions. You're bringing a whole new genre, follow the pictures. If you follow the pictures, you might sit, begin to see where the theology takes place. You're the first to do that. Well done, Mel. I'm not hurting anybody else who's already done what you're going to do. And now in the next video, the next episode, you're actually going to show us an evolution where this actually happens. Woo, can't wait. This is going to be fun. All right. This is Jay here in the United States. Mel, there in Ireland, over and out. <music>